another panel a minute ago. So, um, but you're here in a slightly different guise, I understand. So if you can just, yeah, tell us who you are um, and, yeah, maybe you're kind of how you see your role in relation to this question of uh, public institutions, uh, how sort of new economic organisations can work with, with councils in particular. Yeah, so sad, sadly, workers.coop is not, uh, not, not able to afford me full-time. So my other role is working with Preston Co-op Development Network in, in Preston, uh, essentially on community wealth building, but it's, it's very much a tactical level of essentially raising awareness and setting people set, set up community and, uh, and worker cooperatives. So that the, our relationship is very much with the local authority because if people know it, the Preston model... Uh, kind of came out of the leader of the council being very invested in this concept of community wealth building. So we have a good and strong relationship with the local authority. Great, thanks. Anise, do you want to go next? Hello. Um, hello, my name's Anise Bostein, um, and I am uh, work for Owned by Oxford, which is a community wealth building partnership in Oxford. Yeah, Oxford representation. Um, yes, and so we work closely with um, Oxfordshire County Council, the City Council, um, as well as working sort of outside of, of that space at the grassroots as well. And I'll, I'll say a li- I can say a little bit more later about how we're doing that. Yeah, go ahead, Emily. Hi, I'm Emily, um, and I work for Oxfordshire County Council, so also delighted by the kind of Oxford and Oxfordshire representation here today. I think that's, I think that's great. And, I mean, our role is to kind of, yeah, sit on the other side, I guess, and be um, as best an ally as we can to these kind of ideas and to the kind of ideas that can support our communities to thrive. There was a question in a previous session for people to put their hands up if they were a local government ally, and there weren't many of us here, and that maybe says something about how able local governments are to kind of get on board and wholeheartedly embrace these kind of ideas. But, yeah, I think we'll explore it a bit in the session, but mainly I'm here to learn because I think I'm probably one of the like least expert kind of community wealth builders or new economics practitioners. So, yeah, definitely absorbing absorbing today. Brilliant. Thank you. So, so John, to get, I think, sort of practical straight away, I thought it'd um, be good to just hear... Um, you know, what are some of the kind of particularly good or bad experiences you've had uh, working at that interface between sort of local councils and sort of alternative economic ideas? Yes, yeah, so in Preston, we're, we're very lucky that, yes, the leader of the council is, you know, to some extent obsessed with co-ops. And so at that very high level, you've got that buy-in. Uh, he's wrote a book and all that sort of stuff. And what was really interesting, so that's really good, uh, and equally, the, the uh, cabinet level, the you know the, the cabinet uh, member responsible, the councillor is again interested in this area, if not as 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 expert. So you have that. What's the, the challenge? I suppose is how that converts into the officers. And so, although officers, particularly at the senior level, and particularly in that area of the local authority, kind of get it and have to get it, but but it's at very surface level. And once you go beyond the the kind of that policy area there's basically nothing to, to put it bluntly and so the, the, it's great to have that but it also the challenge is is it's very very service level so I feel sorry for any other local authorities that don't even have that element uh, of buy-in from from the local authority I'm just I'm going to answer the audience a question actually that occurs to me just to double check something so how many people here uh, have heard of community wealth building and feel relatively confident that they know what it means it's not bad. That's probably the most you'd get proportion in, in, in any room, really. But m- maybe if I ask Anis, do you want to have a bash at sort of just defining how you see community wealth building? Because we've, we've arrived already at talking about that, I think, naturally from talking about Preston. So, and then maybe a bit about your experiences. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the way that I would define community wealth building is that it's um, an approach to local economic development um, that's about keeping money circulating within the local economy, creating more resilient local economies that, that really work for people um, and create, um, you know, reduce inequality and increase resilience. Um, and I think how that's been, and I think these guys can probably talk a bit more to some of the council-led approaches to that in Preston and elsewhere, um, 
we have seen some really fantastic examples of that, you know, Preston, Greater Manchester, Islington, etc. Um, I think what, what we saw in Oxford particularly, and I think this is, this is the case elsewhere too, that there can be a disconnect between um, that, that community wealth building work that's being led from the council and an anchor institution level um, and work that's happening at the grassroots um, that you know, might, we might not have called community wealth building, but that we think is. Um, so um, it, within Oxford, what we've been trying to do is bridge that gap. Um, so we set up a partnership called Owned by Oxford, bringing together the local authorities, um, infra infrastructure organisations, you heard from Makespace earlier today, some others here in the room today as well, um, alongside grassroots community organisations that are working within black and minoritised communities. Um, and what we really wanted to do was to sort of amplify um, and support and resource work that's happening at the grassroots. Um, so there's really some really fantastic community organisations um, working within Oxford that are plugging the gaps for a lot of communities that are um, at the sharp end of economic inequality, but that are really under-resourced to do so. Um, and that are not necessarily visible to, um, to councils or to anchor institutions that are looking at creating more inclusive um, economies. So um, we've been trying to make sure that they are become more visible to, to those anchor institutions and, and apply our efforts to resourcing, resourcing that work. So we've been sort of funding posts within um, grassroots community organisations like Oxford Community Action, who are here today, um, to really support them to... Um, scale up the work that they're doing um, to uh, sort of set up community-owned enterprises, community initiatives, to develop the work they're doing around community research that really centres people with lived experience um, in the design of, of solutions that are there to um, solve economic inequality um, and to really kind of push and encourage um, policymakers in, in anchor institutions and councils to um, be supporting that work and to kind of look at how they can um, not just kind of remove barriers but could be aligning that work um, with, with the grassroots activities. Brilliant, thank you. <clears throat> and Emily, yeah, so I, I think just on the other side of that, I guess, and, and, yeah. and I'd be interested to hear a bit about like how you came into working, I guess, within this framework and and how Oxford came, came to be a, a council that sort of saw it as something they wanted to invest in and the value of it. Can we talk a bit about yeah, that? Yeah, definitely. So I'll have to emphasize that it's Oxfordshire. Sorry. <laughs> <Easy mistake>. <laughs> <laughs> Just because we need to be inclusive of all the districts. Um, but, yeah, so my role, I've been working as a, principally a policy officer at at Oxfordshire County Council for a year now and my role has kind of evolved as we've explored this space a bit more but I kind of work on economic inequality, inequality policy and then also um, I'm leading our kind of uh, emerging community wealth building program and I think for a lot of councils the kind of way into this kind of thinking is through the like legislative and statutory frameworks that exist so Things like the Social Value Act that was in, in came in in 2012, I believe, and now has had a new iteration, um, and that kind of requires councils to think about what is the kind of economic impact that investing or um, awarding tenders on a large scale in your area might have on the local people. So if you're awarding a kind of multi-million pound infrastructure contract, what benefit can that bring back into the local economy? Is it local jobs? Is it progress towards sustainability or carbon neutral or those kind of priorities that increasingly councils are forefronting um, in, their, in their programs of work? So that's kind of the um, statutory or legislative like door potentially for a lot of councils. Um, I think also political will is really important. So we have a, um, a coalition in Oxfordshire who have been really clear that inequality is one of their kind of key um, key issues that they want to be tackling. It's closely connected to health inequalities, which in Oxfordshire we see are particularly stark between areas of high and low deprivation. Um, 
And I think like one of the challenges for councils potentially is having the political will and, and as was being said, that trickling down into officers that get it. And I think one of my kind of personal reflections as someone who grew up thinking local government was great and was like delighted to be able to work in local government. Um, if we're kind of creating a generation of new people who are coming to work in local government, um, how can we be generating this, this cohort of people who get it? So, so I came through um, the local government grad scheme, which is run by the local government association. It used to be called the National Graduate Development Programme. It has recently been rebranded as IMPACT. So if, if we have a graduate programme for people coming into local government, what impact are we wanting them to make? And we might be wanting them to be kind of open to ways in which we can do things completely differently. So we are, you know, often people, uh, when you're young, you'll come in thinking, wow, we can do anything. And then you spend years and years in local government and you end up being a bit jaded. So part of it is encouraging a cohort of people who genuinely believe that we are kind of able to do things in a completely different way and you know, there's flexibility somehow sometimes in how we can use the tools and the levers that we have and one of the things that's amazing about community wealth building is that it is exactly encouraging organizations that have power and money to think about the mechanisms by which you spend that money or use that power and it doesn't necessarily change the mechanisms itself it's thinking about how can you make the most out of how you're using these so how can we make the most of how we employ people are we truly accessible to a whole range of different people to find good local employment in Oxfordshire for example are we making sure that we are using every opportunity to unlock assets or to have kind of community stewardship of assets that we own and there's a kind of a whole range of tools I think that we're kind of slowly realizing that we might not be making the most out of and that there is also then mutual benefit to the statutory responsibilities that we have namely to keep people healthy and happy in the places that we are our guardians for that's great thanks thanks a lot so um, I think you know just following on from that I think it's it's possible to sort of when we're thinking about something like community wealth building to kind of split the discussion a little bit because you know within as, as we have done i think because you know coming from a kind of new economy perspective often organizations that are kind of at that grassroots level there is a temptation to sort of think of the sort of practical challenges like what does we're, we're already doing this this is doing this is happening how do we connect it up with that policy agenda but i think we sometimes it's possible to also underestimate the sort of success of the that there has been as an agenda itself. You know, it's, it's one of the few kind of approaches that you could say, new economy approaches that has got sort of national recognition is still talked about. So I wondered, John, if you could just reflect a little bit on, you know, it's now, I think we could say it's like a decade, maybe it's a little bit more since sort of in Preston kind of la landed in the UK and, and started to become a thing people were talking about. You know, people talked about the Preston model that continues to be what it's called in a lot of cases despite the fact that it's happening in, in other cities. But, yeah, just, just kind of uh, focusing on that slightly more zoomed out perspective, how you see how that, you know, the journey that it's been on, where we've got to, and, and maybe how we build upon that going forward? Yeah, so I, I suppose there's been a very good branding job done, I suppose, on community wealth building. It sounds, sounds great uh, as, a, as a set of words. Um, and as, as concept, it all kind of hangs together and makes sense. And I think particularly in Preston itself, yes, there's been some really good top-down policy work done around procurement and, 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 and realigning the council. And so, yes, there's a lot to learn from that. Um, I think to kind of, kind of focus also on the challenges of the model, I think within it, it says community. And I think one of the particular challenges in the Preston model has been, it has been led by the council. It has been quite top down. And so even if they've kind of come this far down to kind of engage with the community, I think particularly in Preston, um, the, the, the community, all the support and the infrastructure for the community to kind of come up and meet in the middle, that work hasn't necessarily been done, even over the last 10 years. It, it really does take a lot of time and a lot of investment. And so there's still this, this huge gap, uh, particularly around procurement, 
uh, and delivering services to the local council, even though that's what the council would love. They would love for the community sector to be in a position to, to win those contracts, but the, the gap is just still too great, even despite the work the council has done. Um, and again, to give, you know, give a bit of context, the, the whole kind of uh, Preston budget for local business development is around 1.5 million. So it's, that's a great amount of money. The amount they've, even within Preston, uh, the amount they've been able to allocate to cooperatives is 50K, 50,000. And so it's, it's the, one of the challenges we will say and to all these different uh, local authorities looking to do this sort of thing is if you want scale and you want the community sector to be able to bid for win contracts and do things at scale, then you, you genuinely do have to throw a lot of money at it. And, and that's just the reality of it. Or you, you're happy that this thing is a slow burn, decades long process of, 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 of building up from, from the grassroots. So I think that's, I would say that's one of the big, the big challenges. It's e it's, it can be easy to do the big picture top down stuff. It's really hard to get the, the community, the community wealth actually being generated. It's great, and, and yeah, I just wanted to is that chime with your experience. I guess you're kind of like you know o o Oxford, Oxfordshire, have kind of arrived at this maybe a bit later in the sense of you know with learning some of the lessons from other places that have done it. But obviously, that you know every place has its own challenges. That kind of particularly the areas of sort of procurement, business development, the joining up of them. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I mean, I would agree with what you said around that, you know, there does, not just in Oxford or Oxfordshire, but I think there has been more of that focus, you know, for, for example, procurement, really around the demand side, um, and not as much emphasis on building up supply chains of those kind of social and community enterprises that, um, that can support community resilience. Um, though I think that that is changing, and I think there is, you know, locally, um, there is greater understanding around those alternative business models and the value that they have. Um, so I think, yeah, that's, that is important. But I think, um, you, know, the, you know, the CLES pillars of community wealth building, um, I think in terms of how they've been implemented by local government, I think some of, some of them are maybe a little bit easier to, to, to touch than others. And I think where, you know, there are, you know, particularly around use of land and assets, I think... Um, we've, you know, seen less progress there, although there has been, you know, a, um, somebody from MakeSpace uh, spoke earlier about um, sort of work that the uh, council worked with them there around kind of transfer of, um, uh, you know, meanwhile leases for community spaces and enter social enterprise spaces, but I think in terms of seeing that kind of transfer of wealth and assets from um, anchor institutions has, you know, we haven't really seen that, and I think that's you know, of course, you know, local governments have been under huge financial pressure, so there's, there is that, um, you know, that, those difficult choices to be making around maximising short-term financial gains compared to um, sort of actions that are going to maybe develop long-term economic resilience, and I think that's really hard um, decisions, but I think also particularly, you know, community wealth building has focused on the roles of anchors, and I think while, you know, with local government there's a clear kind of accountability to the local community, but I think where with other anchors that's not necessarily something that they have s seen as part of their core purpose. Um, thinking about, you know, universities, for example, you know, do they see the local community as one that they, you know, serve or should be accountable to? Um, and, you know, particularly when actually um, community wealth building might in some ways sort of go against their economic interests. Um, though that said, I think, you know, with, with other anchors like, um, you know, hospital trust, I think we have seen things develop, you know, the, um, you know, the evolution of the health anchors learning network and, you know, um, them thinking really around beyond the sort of direct service provision, like what they can be doing upstream to really... Um, influence the social determinants of health and using their land and property, using their retail space. Um, and that's something that we have been working with, um, you know, with the local hospital trust um, in, in Oxfordshire and seeing that, that journey that is happening. Yeah, it feels like there's a real need to sort of procure, there's a particular issue around procurement and business development and matching that up. But, but then beyond that, there's sort of the need to be creative in thinking about other Yes, yeah, and I think, you know, particularly with procurement, I think the, the issue of scale, you know, a lot of the, you know, 
social enterprises, community enterprises, co-ops, you know, aren't of a size necessarily to be directly um, working with anchor institutions. So I think we do need to be looking more at sort of mid, mid-sized organisations um, and who might be looking, you know, they've got their corporate, corporate social whatever it is, I forgot, what, you know, but they're, you know, are looking to procure more ethically, um, you know, can we be, you know, increasing the visibility of smaller community enterprises that they could be, you know, getting catering services from, etc. cetera. Um, and also, you know, what role could local government play in really targeting specific sectors where it, you know, they are finding it difficult to recruit and, you know, um, health or social care, etc. where there could be a more deliberate target investment in developing that supply chain. I'll just I'll go back to John quickly. I'll come to your thoughts on this, Emily. Yeah, just to give it like a super practical example. So in Preston, there's a, a the part of the vision was a big construction co-op to basically help because there's loads of redevelopment in the town centre, and it's like yes, we want a big construction co-op, big contract. And um, and the reality is is that just is you know not going to happen, and it's not going to happen in the short term, and even pairing it down so a constant job we've got as development advisors is pairing it down pairing it down what's what's the minimum we can do what's the least we can do to get the ball rolling and so where that was the big vision a big construction co-op where we've actually landed is a retrofit co-op um, where it's three or four lads from the local council estate who are tradespeople training up some other local young people to start basic retrofit and that's the co-op it's really small 100 grand a year maybe three or four, you know, that sort of scale. And, and it even trying to engage the anchor institution as far as the social, the community, um, in Preston it's called Community Gateway, the Social Land, Landlord, Social Housing, Housing Association, even dealing with that level is not doable. And so we, the contract and the project is actually working with a local independent community centre, the local charity, because they are at the scale where they can risk working with a completely untested, untried project. And our hope with that particular project, with some TLC and incubation, they may be ready in two or three years, two or three years' time, a couple of projects to then have a contract with the local uh, housing association and build and build and build. And it's it's that that sort of grassroots development that we're capable of doing on the sorts of funding we have. And but that's you know for particularly for politicians looking three, four, five years down the line, yeah, you know, is scary you know, for, for, to see a result. Yeah, you know, Emily, I wanted to come back to that, that question of, of sort of anchor institutions that's been raised a couple of times here, and I suppose going a bit beyond sort of, because I think sometimes the discussion just becomes about sort of the council, and the council needs to procure this, and obviously anchor institutions have a big role to play that. There are other types of public institution. Um, what's been your experience of sort of working with anchor institutions and trying to kind of play that sort of facilitative role and, and encourage them? Where have you seen sort of resistance or, or where have you seen success with that? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think kind of some of the like challenges that local governments will have are mirrored in many public sector organisations. So namely not enough money and all of the, you know, all of our colleagues in, you know, NHS trusts or various different organisations will... Um, feel as though it's really challenging to kind of like slice off sections of their time to be able to dedicate to this more preventative upstream work that Anais was talking about. Um, and I think it's really challenging, well, uh, yeah, local government, if, if you can give them credit for anything, it's that they're very acutely aware of being custodians of public money. And that can... that. That's great, but it can also mean that we have put in layers and perhaps too many layers of protections over how that money can then be spent. So in, in terms of working with local government, there almost can be a challenge in how we are in, in, in fear and in how we are able to trust each other. And there's obviously good reasons for those measures because, I mean we'll all be kind of shocked and appalled at the level of contracts from national government that go to people's mates and that's obviously not a good way to run governance and that's some of the reason why all of those kind of pr protections and controls are in place but there's maybe some some gray area between you know giving contracts to your mates and giving you know first refusal to contracts to, of 
for, with people with whom you have built a strong professional relationship and who you have built professional trust with and you know that this local organisation delivers benefit and delivers kind of um, amazing work in a local place and for councils to have the bravery to be able to trust that the relationships that they have built are strong and that we don't need to kind of be quite punitive and prescriptive with how charities or local organisations are reporting on their impact or how they're demonstrating this or demonstrating that. We know that they are and we have that trust with them to be able to deliver that. So then I guess with other anchor institutions, you might have slightly less of that kind of real acute kind of awareness that you are, you know, um, accountable directly to the residents that live where you, where you are um, situated. But I think some of the, um, like, uh, magic, I guess, in the Preston model has been in how it's been the impact reporting. So there was the Lancet report, which... Mm. Um, indicated that I think it was depression diagnoses had, had decreased in Preston and that community wealth building was part of the reason for that. And so that creates a really clear connection between the health of people who live in an area and the way in which the economic system works. And that's a kind of like magic key because that can kind of create a corollary around which uh, local authorities and also health partners and also other anchor institutions such as big employers in the area or the university, things like that, are able to all kind of coalesce around a key um, ambition or requirement for them that is really, really important. So if you're a business, you need your workers to be healthy so that they are turning up to work and doing the best job that they can. If you're a university, likewise, you need your lecturers to be turning up, you need your students to be happy and healthy. If you're a local government, you want your residents to be happy and healthy, and that's also part of the preventative work that I was talking about. So there's a kind of connection that might be quite frustrating in kind of saying well you need to demonstrate that community wealth building works and it's very difficult to measure and how do we kind of assess this like vague well-being but little snippets of being able to do a study like the Lancet study in Preston create that kind of like point of connection that all anchors are able to coalesce around instead of just the kind of direct kind of statutory responsibility that a local government might have, you then suddenly have, you know, other interest of businesses thinking, oh, well, actually, it might be good for my profits if my workers are really happy and enthusiastic to turn up to work because I'm paying them a real living wage. So that's the kind of, like, conversations, I guess, that it's the responsibility of, of a local authority or of a combined authority to be able to be championing and having and it takes a level of self-confidence maybe to be able to do that and I think a lot of councils maybe don't have that confidence but it's definitely uh, on its way I think I think it's a developing yeah area if I can if I can um I mean one thing that you didn't mention um which uh, I don't know if it's modesty, but you know the the county council and the city council um, have um, were very instrumental in setting up um, the Oxfordshire Inclusive Economy Partnership, um, which brought together a lot of the big anchor institutions and um, businesses um, in Oxfordshire with the shared aim of um, addressing economic inequality. So I think that has created a forum that is is really important and and an interface as well for um, third sector organisations like ourselves who um, want to be engaging with them around that that, that wasn't there before. Um, and of course, you know, we we have critiques of that. And you know, as I'm going back to the sort of community led model that we were discussing earlier, and that is work. You know, the, the council has been very supportive um, to us in trying to. Um, you know, encourage that that network of anchors to um, to deepen um, the way that they see participation from the community and to think about how they are accountable to um, to the communities that they seek to serve and to kind of shift that um, perception, I suppose, of um, seeing um, community members as sort of 
passive recipients of, of interventions um, towards seeing um, people as, as citizens who are active um, agents of change in, in creating fairer economies. But yeah, I think that you know that's where those local authorities can play a really important role in convening and creating space for those conversations. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm really keen to make sure we've got plenty of time to question, so I'm just going to ask, I've got a couple more things, and I'll, I'll let you decide whether you want, want to answer both of these or one of them. But, um, yeah, I was quite interested to hear about, because obviously a lot of the focus that we talked about can be on procurement, and can be on and sort of that's the way that you engage as a new economy organisation with the council, but whether there are any examples, particular examples that you'd come across that you thought were really interesting, creative examples of, of new economy or other organisations engaging with their local council or maybe with another public institution that's not about just being procured, you know, something something other than that. And then I, I guess just what would be your practical recommendations for, for a new economy organisation that, that was looking to engage with a local council? What would be the kind of key things that you would point to? So do you want to, I mean, I'll let anyone who's got something to say on that start, do you want, if you want to go first or... Yeah, so, um, oh, how do I frame it? So, uh, Preston Cop Development Network uh, got some funding that was matched from the council through Power to Change, thank you. Uh, and it started really, it was a very complex load of funding and we only had one element. But because we were already in situ, we started first. And a lot of the other parts of the broader funding programme hadn't been essentially doled out yet. And so what the council did, which was fantastic, was they essentially brought us into a bit of a steering board, steering committee, and so as they were developing the other elements of the programme, they were basically, we were the critical friend. And we were like, ah, oh, that's not going to work. And so, and things like that. And so it was a really good example of the local authority being, you know, they had the money, they, they'd brought the, the big programme together, but they were using us as the kind of community partner to kind of sense check stuff. And as, as happened and always happened, something fell through. It was leaning on us to see who we knew in the local community who could backfill and support. And so it was a really good example of where that funded program ended up was absolutely not what was in the original funding bid. Uh, and if an infrastructure organisation like ours hadn't been in the room as a critical friend and uh, you know, diplomatic kind of confidant, for want of a better word, it, it helped us get our agenda across and it also helped the council out of a challenging situation. And so I think be a good friend, be a polite and diplomatic friend, but equally point out when you just don't think something's going to work. And if you can get that relationship and trust well as, a, 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 as an independent organisation to the council, then I think they pay that back to you. That's, my, that's been my experience anyway. Well, it's kind of both, both at once there. I think you managed, which is good. Any, any kind of thoughts, practical tips, or, or kind of particular examples you'd like to highlight? Um, I can, yeah. I mean, in terms of sort of tips or things that we've learnt. Um, I think what was quite critical with Owned by Oxford was um, getting really early buy-in from, from the council. So we um, funded a role in the city council, um, a sort of community wealth building officer that sat on our steering group. And that has meant that we've had that constant point of contact and ongoing buy-in from them, um, from their team economic development team and um, you know and now we've seen that they've now funded that as a permanent role there and that that's sort of led to changes within their economic development strategy that's um, sort of seen community wealth building reflected in there so I think that feels like a really key one um, and I think um, I, th I think one that we're sort of <laughs> that's becoming more apparent is sort of the importance of setting your own agenda um, as we're sort of working with big anchor institutions and, and the council as well we're seeing you know with you know the anchor network I mentioned earlier you know they're setting their own strategy for developing an inclusive economy and um, while we don't have um, a sort of community-led kind of unified vision for that you know we have sort of limited ability to kind of Im influence there so you know, we're now looking at how we can um, create a community-led commu um, community manifesto um, and that presents a set of asks of what it is that we would like to see from local government, from anchor institutions, for how they can help um, create a more resilient local economy. Um, yeah, I'll, st I'll stop. Well, no, I'll say one more. Um, I think, yeah, and just, you know, I think we have a really important role to play in encouraging... Um, councils to, to be even more ambitious and I think where 
Um, we have seen change across the UK. It's really been dependent on local leaders who've kind of initiated that, and we've been quite fortunate in Oxfordshire, but I think, you know, that's national government hasn't been kind of supporting that agenda, and that may, that may change quite quickly and dramatically. Let's see. Um, but I think that's, you know, a space that we can occupy and kind of really making the most of the the increased understanding around the importance of co-production and participation, community participation, really build, building on that. Thanks. Emily? I'll, I'll start with a good example, because, I mean, there's loads in Oxfordshire, and um, I know that McKenna from Flows in the Park is here today, which is very exciting because that's a kind of uh, community hub that was developed out of a Sure Start Centre and provides a whole range of benefit to the local community, including a cafe and employment for um, a whole range of different people, space for uh, community midwives and a refill shop. Um, and so that was obviously a collaboration between the County Council, actually also the City Council and um, flows itself but a caveat to that is that I know from having spoken to McKenna and Annie who set that up that the process was very difficult <laughs> with the council and that the council <laughs> perhaps didn't you know completely make make that um, something that was really easy to achieve so I'd say that is a good example that we often shout about in Oxfordshire, but there's a caveat that it, we can learn from it as well and we can improve from, from how, that, how that came about. Um, and then my recommendation, I guess, would be uh, to be persistent. <laughs> don't be put off by emailing people who work at the council and they don't get back to your email. They probably saw it and thought amazing and then got completely sidetracked and never came back to it. So definitely like keep asking the question, keep speaking to people. And I realized that that's you know, frustrating and energy consuming. Um, and that, that you, I think council officers would agree that we wish we had more time to be able to you know, give to um, engaging with new economics organizations and, and community groups generally. Um, but I mean, I know just from working with Anais, she kept asking the question and we, I think it's built a, a better relationship between us in which we're actually able to invest some time in, you know, thinking about how can we make the Oxfordshire Inclusive Economy Partnership something that is a space that's not exclusive of people from black minority ethnic groups or from the global majority or any of those kind of um, communities that might feel like that's not a space where they can express their experiences or their desires or, or uh, wants from the local area. Um, so, yeah, definitely persistence, keep poking. Um, and with maybe just with a, an understanding kind of, as I mentioned previously, that local government has limitations that are both necessary and frustrating, and there's a kind of happy medium that we maybe haven't quite reached yet, but we're kind of often as frustrated as you might be by the kind of <laughs> systems in which we're having to, having to work. That's great, thank you. So we'll go to questions now, I think. I'll maybe just, as we set that up, finish. We haven't talked much about context, um, obviously, with the election. We're yet to see maybe what the impact of that will be on, on local government, but one maybe promising sign I spotted the other day was that the, uh, the Ministry for Communities, Housing and Leveling Up is now, again, the Ministry for Communities, Housing and Local Government. So who knows if that means much, but, you know, we've got to take that as a positive sign. So we go for questions. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Maddie. I live here in Bristol. Um, uh, so this is, this is really about the, all the stuff that's come up around planning and opening up the green belt to housing and um, that kind of aggressive almost stance that the new government is centrally has a very strong narrative around that and will fight the rural NIMBYs and which probably isn't a very good approach seeing as a lot of them probably voted for them for the first time um, but I wonder, my question really is around how the county council there in those sort of peri-urban spaces might hold that new economic and community wealth building agenda in the, in the context of, of new settlements, um, new communities, maybe new towns, new villages that will be coming over the horizon soon. 
I like a challenging question. <laughs> um, I Honestly, I'll start by saying I'm not an expert on planning. The County Council is the planning authority for highways, but not for housing. So the districts and the City Council, that's their domain. They determine local plans, and that's the kind of legislative framework through which housing infrastructure specifically is managed. Um, I'd say, I mean, I was talking earlier to someone about some good examples. So there was an instance in Oxfordshire where I think Cherwell District Council were able to sell small plots of land um, that had been decommissioned, I think, from military use to people who wanted to build their own homes so they would sell the land relatively cheaply and then people were encouraged to be able to build you know what whatever self-build home they wanted to build um, and I think there were some ambitions or stipulations around the sustainability and the the environmental impact of of those homes but there was a real encouragement that the kind of street that was being like literally created from the ground up would have a really strong kind of community understanding of how that um, group of people who had constructed their own homes would would interact. Um, I think in Oxfordshire particularly, we have quite a challenging situation in which we have very high cost of housing. Uh, we have um, a lot of like outstanding areas of outstanding natural beauty. We have a lot of uh, green spaces. We also have a lot of growth industries. So uh, science parks and the university particularly driving innovation in that area. So yeah, there's definitely a challenge for the council in recognizing that those areas of kind of investment and of employment are really important to the county. It's part of what makes Oxfordshire relatively new unique. We have a lot of kind of intellectual benefit that we then can bring to the rest of the country or to the rest of the world, things like vaccines and green technology. Um, but the people who come to Oxfordshire to work on those things need somewhere affordable to live. So some of the answers might be about uh, densification, if that's a word. Are we building kind of terraced housing or are we building apartment blocks, that kind of thing. Um, but it's definitely very challenging, especially with having a city centre that is so historic um, with so many, so many important buildings there and just such kind of small streets. Oxford wasn't designed to be an urban centre particularly. Um, so, yeah, it's a real challenge. I'm not sure if I can answer your question completely fully. <laughs> Maybe another um, session, that one. But, yeah, it's kind of a whole, a whole thing. But, um, yeah, there, are, there, there definitely are ways in which partnership can, particularly with things like community land trusts. We have a lot of community land trusts in Oxfordshire. It's quite a strong um, sector. And there definitely are ways in which partnerships can can bring positive or um, collaborative solutions to those kinds of things. But... Yeah, we might come back to issues about seed funding and things like that, but yeah, I'll maybe leave it there. Brilliant, thank you. Take another question. Hi, I'm Simon. I'm from Oxfordshire, but I, I'm now working in Salford. Um, and I'm just interested, two, quick two-part question. Um, how important or key do you see the role of the intermediary organisations, such as owned by Oxford and Preston, um, community Development Network, and how are you funded? That's a good quick one. You can take each, I think. I will, of course, say we're very important. Um, I mean, you know, we're not... I think, you know, key is that we're, we're not an organisation. We're a partnership of organisations, and I think that's where our strength is, is that we've brought together a lot of partners who, um, across different sectors and, and different scales... Um, and, uh, yeah, we are funded primarily, yeah, through foundations. Um, so, um, yeah, my organisation, I work for a, an infrastructure organisation. We are partly funded by, uh, well, majority funded by the county council as well, So, which is um, very fortunate to have core funding. Um, yeah, but our community wealth building work is, is primarily funded through um, grant funding. Yeah. Um, and Preston Cop Development Network is funded partly through um, uh, coming to an end actually now, but a, a, a grant from Power to Change linked to match funded with the local authority, uh, and then that's transitioned into uh, UK shared prosperity funding, which is the leveling up stuff. If people know 
about that. But like I say, it's about, our, our turnover is about 50 grand a year, actually. So it's very, very small, very lean organisation and our board is, is made up of volunteers. Um, I suppose to give an example of, one thing I would say is, having an entity that is an infrastructure organisation in a locality is really useful because it exists, if you know what I mean. It can be in the conversations and just the fact it exists means people know there's a cooperative development body, whereas in the vast majority of places in the country, sadly, there isn't. So just having a presence in itself is, is a value. Uh, the other element that's particularly useful is as an incorporated body with a bank account and s some infrastructure, we've incubated two of, of the enterprises that are setting up in Preston. Uh, Community Energy Preston, which will be working with anchoring institutions to put solar panels on roofs as one example, and this retrofit uh, co-op as another example. In both cases, there was a very fast turnaround in the funding that they'd been able to draw on, and they just didn't have the capability to set up an organisation in the time frames to, to get that funding and, and also show legitimacy and show they could be trusted, but by being a, an institution that already existed with a track record, we could take that funding for them, incubate them, and both of those organisations will float off, hopefully within the next year, with their own bank accounts, their own incorporated organisations, and we will basically let them flow off. And, and that's, again, I, I'm not sure how often that happens around the country, but because we exist and we've got the flexibility to do that sort of thing, and, the, and again, the council trusts us because of our track record, that's really valuable. That's great, thanks. But we've got time for one more, have we? If it's a very quick one question. One very quick question with a, a quick answer. Quick answer. <laughs> yeah. Anybody? Hi, um, so I'm Kerry. I'm doing a PhD in community wealth building. So major plug, I'd love to interview all of you for my research. Um, quick question. Um, one of the criticisms is that community wealth building is something that's done to a community by anchor institutions. So quick quick fire round of what do you see as the role of the community in community wealth building? Not 100% sure that's a quick answer, but if you, if you have to answer this in a couple of words, I suppose. You've, you've answered it a bit already, haven't you, John, I guess, but like, what would you particularly focus on, maybe? Oh, uh, can you come back to me, actually? Sorry. Okay. Either of you? Um, I, I know I spoke to this earlier, so I'll try not to repeat what I said, but I think yes, central, and I think we need to reclaim the name of community wealth building, um, and the community needs to set the agenda, and um, anchor institutions and local government uh, need to support that agenda. That's the ideal. We'll see if that happens. <laughs> Emily? Yeah, I think really key as well, uh, as ever, doing things in a kind of truly co-productive method takes time and resources and so I think a council has to be willing to um, accommodate for that so if you're setting up a fund or kind of grant funding you and you expect it to be you know co-produced or you want it to be co-produced you, you need additional funding on the on top of the pot in order to be able to facilitate that um, I think that's something that councils are getting better at recognising. We've got a um, partnership currently with our local integrated care board, if that's the <laughs> right title. keeps changing, so I get confused. Um, and I can't remember all of the names of what the officers are called, but essentially the grant comes with funded positions for community development workers to then um, have a collaborative and distributive um, approach to how the grant funding gets spent so they work directly with the communities to be able to understand what the needs are how the money can be best used and how it's distributed instead of that sitting in, in the you know corporate core I guess or in the center of the of the council so yeah really essential and I mean also just working with organizations such as owned by Oxford as critical friends to be able to um be a, a voice that light brings to light or you you actually might be missing the point here a little bit um, and that's really valuable as a kind of starting point to be able to understand how co-production works best thank you yeah so the reason i struggled with it is absolutely the community should be you know taking back this agenda and all of that sort of stuff but the problem is is when I visualise the people I deal with on a daily basis, they are so busy doing other stuff and I wouldn't want to put the expectation on them to take back 
control of this or to do more than the urgent work they're already doing. And so I think your, your point absolutely is funding the capacity of people to get involved is absolutely critical. Brilliant. I think with that, we will wrap up and I will hand back over to Nicola. To tell you.